Hi guys, welcome to Netronics and welcome to Rev one and a half of our Lego Defender powered by the Kria KR260, which as you can hear in the audio is alive and well, so I apologize for the CPU fan noise. Let's get into what has changed since video one. control, which we ended off in part one with our most basic obstacle avoidance, which was if we saw our obstacle, we simply stopped moving, and once the obstacle was out of frame, we started moving again. Rev one and a half, I've incorporated the steering aspect into it, so instead of just stopping, we're now going to steer around our object. Since I need to know exactly what position the wheels are in, since there's only so far left or right that we can turn and then also I need to know how to return back to a straight orientation. I chose to go with uh, an N20 motor with two Hall Effect sensors on it for encoders. However, this is the first place that I found to add to my list of mechanical issues to fix before I'm going to call this Rev2. Even though there's the two Hall Effect sensors and I'm getting output A and output B that's supposed to give me a finer resolution as to where the encoder wheel is, it's still not quite a fine enough resolution as to what I need to know exactly where the wheels are. I'm also not sure if there's maybe just something wrong with this particular motor, but I don't get the same readouts when I do the same motions. So I did a lot of testing where I would have the wheels straight, I'd turn them 90 degrees to the left, and every time I'd do that, I would think that I would get the same readings because the wheel should be turning the same amount in the same place, but I wasn't. So. That's gonna- I'm gonna need to replace this motor with a different encoder, figure that out. So for now, I had to create an algorithm where I went back to the tried and true. I just timed how long it takes to turn half a turn, so go from straight to either left or either right or left. And then I timed how long it takes to go all the way from uh, right back to left and vice versa. And then I just had to write extra code to keep track of where the wheel direction is currently. So that's not ideal, but it's at least working for now because the main focus was getting into more obstacle avoidance type um, agile development. So now that we have that all hooked up, we'll, we've, I've moved on to, like I said, looking at the actual script that is controlling the logic of, okay, I, I'm taking in an image from our camera here to see where the obstacle is. Am I going to turn left or right to avoid our obstacle? I learned quite a bit in this process. I was originally thinking I might have to have multiple um, ML models running, which I still might at some point, but for now, I notice whenever you're running through Edge Impulse and you're using their runner application, you get four data outputs from uh, the bounding box and image information. You have an x-axis, so the, your image is x pixels long. You have your y-axis, so your image is y pixels tall. And then you also get a width and height output, which the width of the bounding box and the height of the bounding box. So with that data, I was able to determine, looking at the x output, solely for now, because we're taking baby steps, we're agile developing our way through this. Well, I found that the image from this particular camera, after doing a lot of trial runs, is 90 pixels wide. So I basically just said, if I see a bounding box between 0 and 45, I'm going to turn right around it, and if I see a bounding box from 45 to 90, I'm going to turn left around it. which sounds really silly. I'm overthinking left and right again now that I'm on camera. <laughs> that has been a lot of trial and error. 
I think we're finally there. As I mentioned in the previous video, I have compiled this particular obstacle avoidance model, or well, the object detection model, I should say, that I trained to look for our little 3D printed jack-o'-lantern obstacle. I trained it saying that the target was a Raspberry Pi 4, since the Kriya hardware is not officially in Edge Impulse Studio yet, and I expected to hit some problems with it at some point. Uh, I expected it to maybe be with a more complex algorithm, but I did find the first weirdness that that's causing. Whenever you're using the Edge Impulse runner service in either Python or whatever language you're using, it's outputting four data points for each image, that X, Y data of the actual image, and then the width and height of the bounding boxes. Because I'm basing my obstacle avoidance, whether to turn left or right as to where the object is on that X axis, I started getting weird things where the wheels would just suddenly turn sporadically. And going back and collecting the X axis data and plotting it, I noticed I was getting a lot of sporadic points. So I knew the obstacle was in the left side of the frame, but even though it was showing mostly in the left side of the frame, I would, in the middle of that, I would randomly get right side of the frame data points, which that has to be something with the ML model not being compiled for this specific processor because it would also get worse the longer I would let the script run at a time. So, Obviously something weird's going on there. I'm gonna have to fix that. I'm adding to the checklist for Rev2. Also, as far as software goes, I still haven't fully solved the issue of the permissions for the system GPIO permissions. So I do still have to manually export each GPIO pin and then send the privileges back to the Ubuntu user to be able to access them from the Python scripts. Again, that's something I feel like is fairly straightforward to solve. My Linux skills are still getting there. I'm sure someone can help me out in the comments below. So with all that being said, let's see how it's working now. I'll give it a minute to find the camera. So we're still having a little bit of weirdness with the model seeing things, but as you can see, it's still somewhat working, uh, which makes me very excited because I've spent a lot of time on this and it's been quite the learning curve, especially more so from the mechanical side of it, which as you can hear from all of that cracking, I've got a lot of updates I need to make. Also, as I've been going through this, I mentioned previously that we still haven't quite taken advantage of all the capabilities of the KR260 uh, chip on the Kriya, which that's a huge part of it. Um, I've been looking to offload a lot of different tasks onto the actual FPGA fabric to get it to run faster, more efficiently. Um, which I think tearing down the Edge Impulse model and actually compiling it natively maybe to run for the Kriya, um, because I need to actually compile it for the particular ARM that's in the KR260 because it's not the same ARM chip that's in the Raspberry Pi 4, so I'm sure that's causing some of the weirdness with the algorithm not always working right. But progress! progress. I'm very excited for progress. Um, if there's something I've learned in my years of being an engineer is if you try to do it perfect the first time, you'll never get it done. So little incremental steps <laughs> is what it takes. So while this may be a brief part two video to the previous part one, I still think there was a lot of important updates made here. Um, and like I said, We've just added to the checklist of Rev2, which I'm really excited to continue on into 2023. That's gonna be great. Uh, now that we have a very direct checklist of what to do, what to offload into the KR260 FPGA fabric, all the mechanical changes that need to be made, which hurt my soul a little bit, but we're gonna do it. Um, 
because I still got to show up my senior design robot from my undergrad and I don't think we're quite there. So stay tuned. I have all of these videos coming in 2023 plus a whole bunch more. Um, I'd love your feedback in the comments below as always, uh, things that you do differently or just things you'd like to see in general. So thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. I'll catch you next time. Bye. <laughs>